To stop and review just for a second, if you want to start from scratch, you'll generally use the blank app template to get started. But what you get there is a blank page based on the blank page template, which has no code and no support. So most likely you'll want to replace that main page.xaml with a page based on the basic page template. In order to get important features, the one we'll focus on is saving and restoring user information, which comes basically for free once you add that basic page template. Given that scenario, however, let's go back to our demonstration and add some simple user interface. In order to make it easier to build the samples, I've created a snippet file containing XAML and C Sharp so I don't have to type them manually. Believe me, you don't want to watch me type if you don't have to. To start creating the markup, I'll take this stack panel element, copy it, and paste it into the grid. Here I've added a stack panel in grid.row1. If you'll recall from prior working with XAML, grid rows are zero based. The first row has the button and the title in it, and the one row, which is actually in English, the second row of the grid, contains our content. The margin is set, it contains a text block and another stack panel, which is horizontal, which has a margin of zero and 20. Within that stack panel is a text box and a button. And the button has the content click me. And then we have a text block whose name is greeting output, whose font size is 36. And that's where we'll put output when we run the application. So we've created a very simple stack panel. And you'll notice that some of these elements have X colon name attributes applied to them so that we can refer to them in code. For example, name input and greeting output are the name attributes for the text block here and the text box here that we'll interact with in code. We're going to also add a slider so we can change the font size of the output. Let's go back to our snippet file and get that. Here I want to place this slider within the same stack panel as greeting output. So let's get that slider, find greeting output. Here it is, and let's put a slider in there. So you can see we have a slider control here whose name is font size slider. Its width is 300 and so on. You'll notice that when I paste markup in, it's going in with one attribute per row on the screen, which makes it easier to read, I think, and that's a setting you can make within the options in Visual Studio. Let me select everything and reformat that code by pressing Control K, Control F, that's the default key mapping for reformatting the code, and now it's easier to read. Well, we've got our entire user interface here, so let me save everything, build the application, seems to build just fine and run it. And look, there's our application. There's a prompt that says, what's your name? I'll enter my name. I'll press the click me button and sadly nothing happens. I can change the slider and it does change the value. But again, that does nothing because we haven't added anything to make it happen. We'll need some way to handle events in order to add some behavior to this application. One thing we haven't talked about is the other markup that's part of this basic page. We sort of jumped right in. Let's take a moment to review what we find. First, this page is based on the layout aware page whose code we saw earlier. There's some page level settings here, including some namespace declarations and a class name for the code behind file and so on. We'll find some page level resources. Here, for example, is a string named app name, so we can refer to it by name later on in the markup, and I could change that to be, oh, sample app or something like that, just to make a change. And we'll see how that gets hooked up as we dig a little deeper down here. The grid that's created for you in this template contains two rows. Row zero contains the back button and page title here, and row one contains the rest of the page layout where we placed all of our content. You can see the grid has a style. 
with a static resource of layout root style, which is defined in one of those style sheets we haven't investigated. Here are the row definitions. The first row is 140 pixels high and the second row, having an asterisk here, fills in the remainder of the space. Within that grid, we have a grid containing the first row contents, which has column definitions where the first width is auto, meaning it's just wide enough for its contents, and the second column has the rest of the width. Now in that grid, we have a button whose name is back button. When you click it, it calls a go back procedure, which must be defined somewhere in the base class because we didn't define it. There's other information about that button. There's a text block whose name is page title. And you'll see here that its text is set to a static resource named app name. That's why we see the text sample app here because this code looks for a resource named app name, gets its contents and displays it in that text property. Here is that resource named app name and that content is what we see here. We also have a style defined again in one of the built in style sheets. And then here's the content we added. So you've seen everything in the page now. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Down here at the bottom are some visual state groups which define the layout for different orientations of the page. That's outside the scope of what we'll cover here, but you'll need to investigate that content to lay out your page differently if, if the device is rotated. For now, we need to add some events. So when we click that button, something happens. As in any other development environment, XAML elements raise events when certain things happen. These event messages allow you to take action in your application, and that's the basis of building a XAML-based application. You create event handlers to handle those events. The user clicks a button, and you create an event handler for the click event. The question is always, which event should you handle? Metro style applications will be running on different devices. Some use a keyboard and the mouse, others might use a touch screen. Events like click and double tapped are device independent. Doesn't matter if you actually have a mouse or you actually click, it still works fine if you just tap on something. In .NET, for example, you might have different events to handle movement. There was a mouse move, a touch move, a stylus move event, in Metro style apps, you'll find there's just one event. There's the pointer moved event, which works for all scenarios. The mouse moves, the touch moves, or the stylus moves. Obviously for our simple button click, we just need to handle the click event. Although Visual Studio provides a number of different ways to hook up event handlers, here's the way I find the simplest. Select the control where you'd like to add the event and bring up the properties window, which I'm doing by pressing F4. In the properties window, you'll see the little event handlers button. So I'll click that and then find the event I want to add an event handler for. Here it's the click event. Here I need to add a name for the procedure I'll call. You can call this whatever you like. The standard way of doing it is to type a name like button underscore click and press enter once you've named that procedure. When you press enter, you're taken into the code for that event handler, and here you can add your code. Here I just want to set greeting output.text equal to hello, comma, plus name input.text plus, oh, I'll put an exclamation point to make it extra special. There we are. And we have our output string, which will just say hello and whatever you entered into the text box. Let's save and run this. And we should now be able to type a name, click the button, and boy, is that exciting again. I'm easily excited. I'd also like to hook up some way of modifying the value of the slider. And as I modify the value, change the font size of the content of this text block. Although I could write code to do that, and I could do it in 
the value changed event of the slider. I don't have to. I can use declarative data binding to hook this up and it's very simple to do that. All I need to do is find the slider and set its value not to be 36, but to use the built-in binding pseudo element. Here I'll type binding and I can specify what element I want to bind to. I want to bind to the element whose name is greeting output. I'll set the path to be the property of that element I want to bind to. It's the font size property. And I'll set the mode. The mode can be one way or two way. I'll set this to be two way. So that if we were to change the font size of the text block somewhere else, it would change the slider. And if we change the slider, it changes the font size of the text block. That's all that requires. Let me save that, build it, and run this. And now I'll type this here, click me. And now if I change the font size, you'll see the font size of the text block get bigger. And if I make it smaller, it gets smaller. You might wonder why I made that a two-way binding because you can't change the font size of a text block here, but we can change it in code. And if we change it in code, we would want the slider to change as well. And the one place we do change it in code is in the startup for this application where there is a default font size set for that text block and I want the slider to reflect that when the application first starts. So by making that a two-way binding, that happens automatically. So although I could have written code to make this happen, I didn't. Instead, I hooked up some binding instead. We'll look more at binding a little later on. Now right now, notice how this application looks. It has a dark styling, but Metro Style apps also support a light styling. To set that, let's go back to our project and open up the app.xaml file. In app.xaml, we can specify a requested theme. Come up here and specify requested theme. And you'll notice there are two options, dark or light. Dark must be the default since it wasn't specified there. And we'll choose light instead. And now I'll save it and run it again and things look different. Instead of being all dark, it's all light instead. I'll put another name in, click me, and we see everything still works the same. It just has a different styling now. All the elements appear differently. Now, of course, you have the option of just changing the style of any single element as well. So we come back here, we can modify a particular element. Let me go back to our markup now you'll notice, by the way, that it takes a few seconds for the application to shut down, even when I press Alt F4. Don't immediately start trying to change code or you'll get an error when you do. It took a few seconds. Let me go to that first text block here, which is that text block. And now let's look at the properties of that text block. I'll have to click the wrench button again to get properties for that element. And down here in the miscellaneous group, you'll see there is a style property. I'm going to click this little square to its right to modify it. And there are a bunch of built in styles as part of the resource, which was the style sheet. And you can see here are all the styles that were defined in that style sheet. So I'll select at this point the basic text style and that modifies the style a little bit. You can see it changed it on the screen and it also set the style here in the markup. It set the style to be a static resource named basic text style. Let's select the button here and let's set a style for that. I'll go to its properties here. Again, choose miscellaneous. There's the style attribute. Let's select it. I'll choose a local resource. And for buttons, there are a lot more styles. I'll choose the text button style, and that changes the style altogether. It actually shows it without a border. Let's save and run this so you can see what it looks like. 
it may be hard to tell, but we've changed the style for this text block. It's a little larger now. And we've certainly changed the style for this button. It doesn't have any border and hovering over it makes it turn into a lighter gray color. And of course, this still works. There's my name. And let me go back and let's modify the style individually. We can set individual properties of that style. I'm gonna to go to that button here, look at its properties, go to that style, and choose Convert to New Resource. That is, I'm not gonna modify the existing resource, I'll make a new resource. And I'll call it My Button Style, probably not a very good name. And I can choose where to store that new style, either in the application or in this document. If I choose to store it in the application, it'll store it in app.xaml. So let's go do that. And you'll see now that we have a new resource applied to that button, my button style. Let me save everything. I'll go back to app.xaml and here is that new style. So it copied all the settings that were defined in the original style and made a new style here called my button style that explicitly defines all the settings for that style. Down here, you can see we have styles that define a rectangle around the button. So I'm going to change that opacity from zero, which means it doesn't show up at all, to 100, meaning it shows up fully opaque. If we go back to our button now, well, it's hard to see, but there should be a rectangle around that button. Let me go back to the style and make sure I got the right one. There it is, we have our opacity 100. And if I run this now, the button looks slightly different. It has, well, it's difficult to see, but it's a dashed rectangle around the button. We turned that rectangle from being hidden to being opaque. So it shows up and of course the app functions the same way it did before. Now there's one thing that's bugging me here and that is I ran this last time, I type my name and I type click me, I ran it again, but it didn't save that name. I had to retype it. In almost every application, you want to be able to preserve application state. So users don't have to retype important information. Not that this is important, but in lots of applications it might be. So here we need some way to save and restore application state. 